if we continue to sustain them militarily, they have the creativity, they have the dynamism to certainly uh, recapture significant amounts of the country which are occupied by the Russians at the moment. What should we be doing about Putin now? Or is the problem we're in the product of not doing something about him sooner? Well, I think you can look back and say that the policy that Obama followed in 2014 when uh, there was this initial Russian invasion um, of bits of Ukraine, Crimea in particular, the way that this was handled with the benefit of hindsight was probably a mistake. It's very easy to say these things after the event. And the West's inactivity, its, its lack of response clearly encouraged Putin in his larger plans, you know, then to have a major invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. But uh, there's no question at the end of the Cold War we made a serious attempt you know, to have a different relationship with the Russians, to have a dialogue with them. And for a very brief, there was a brief window, particularly after Putin was elected and Tony Blair went to Moscow, I went to Moscow several times, um, and we had a dialogue with the Russians, but you know, it wasn't sustained. It, 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 it went wrong pretty quickly. And actually, by the time I retired in 2004, my last visit to Moscow was a pretty frosty and difficult affair. By then, things had happened. There, there were sort of specific issues at the time which became major irritants in the relationship between the United Kingdom and Russia. And similarly, the Americans had a similar experience. What does that frostiness, how does that manifest itself? Were you meeting Putin then, or were you sort of meeting your Russian... Well, I mean, in previous visits, one had had a very high-level access and very interesting meetings and conversations, which were unique, because, you know, none of us had had that experience during the Cold War. But the last time I went to Moscow, you know, you could feel the doors were closing and that you were not welcomed in the same way as one had been. And... Uh, although we had this relationship and we had a dialogue which we were trying to make it work, it didn't really produce anything. So, and the Russians are quite good at sending messages <laughs> <laughs> without actually being rude to you, but my last visit was not an easy occasion at all. What, what happens next, do you think, with, with Russia? Can Putin be beaten? Or is this, this war, this invasion of Ukraine, going to be the, the long slog that everyone hoped it wouldn't be, what, 12 months ago? Well, I think it's very difficult to make a prediction at this point in time. I think it's very important that UK Ukraine emerges from this war, having regained its territory. I mean, bear in mind we're talking about naked aggression and Russia taking the territory of another country, whatever the historic relationship between Ukraine and Russia may be. So victory really would be for Ukraine to regain most, if not all, of its territory that Russia has occupied. And I think from the point of view of European security, this for the Ukrainians is not, you know, a specially, special military operation. This, this is a European conflict of real significance. And I think it's important that Ukraine comes out of this having regained, I don't think you should talk about, you know, victory, that you, you, having regained its own territory, having regained its own country. And I mean, Zelensky's made a pretty clear statement about what the preconditions for an ending of the war are. And I think that there's, there's no way yet that the Ukrainians are prepared to compromise on any of those conditions. And what do you say to those people who... So, well, actually, that's not that's not realistic. You need to talk about a settlement. Uh, you know, you need to come to some sort of peace compromise with with China. That actually, Britain is not the all power and global power that it was, and therefore we need to be willing to to do deals to compromise. It's too early to uh, consider what those deals, what the compromise might be if it's ever going to be acceptable to the Ukrainians. I mean, the Ukrainians militarily feel that they can still, as it were, regain territory. Uh, OK, there may come a point at the future where it's a frozen conflict and you're beginning to look towards some sort of diplomatic solution, armistice line, um, some sorts of compromise. But there's no way at the moment... I mean, I've just been in Ukraine and the Ukrainians are absolutely clear-cut. 
And I think if we continue to sustain them militarily, they have the creativity, they have the dynamism to certainly uh, recapture significant amounts of the country which are occupied by the Russians at the moment. And I think it's very, very important that you know, we sustain them during the conflict. You know, there are concerns and worries like the threat of maybe a Trump administration coming back as a result of the next presidential election. And we've all seen the polls that tell us that Trump is maybe the front runner and, and may well be in the lead politically. And Trump saying, oh, I could solve the problem in 24. I mean, what he means is if we cut off supplies to Ukraine, Ukraine will have to compromise. Uh, that's pretty worrying. I, I don't think it, the threat is quite that blunt. But on the other hand, it does put the Ukrainians under pressure militarily to make significant progress before November 2024, when I think, is that the date of the election? It is the date of the election, yeah.